Hi everyone, my name is Eva Matthews Lark, manager of Hog Island Audubon Camp in Maine. Welcome to our Making Connections lecture series where we bring a bird focused presentation to you each week on Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. These presentations are free, but donations are encouraged to help fund our programs. The donation link for Hog Island in the chat box or the comment section for the viewing on Facebook. Also consider checking out our other programs at hogisland.audubon.org. We have a wonderful guest. We also will have the chance for a live uh, Q&A afterwards. So if you have questions, feel free to drop those in the comment section. This week, we're proud to have Holly Merker join us for Introduction to Birding. Holly is a professional birding guide and environmental educator. She's been about the art of bird identification for over two decades. Volunteer eBird reviewer, a co-founder of the Frontiers of Ornithology Symposium, and recently was elected to the Hawk Mountain Board of Directors. This past year, she co-launched ID boot camps and ornotherapy with birding guide Richard Crossley. And at Hog Island, she is an instructor for our Monhegan migration sessions, also the director of Building Better Birding Skills. Thanks so much, Holly, for joining us tonight. Well, thank you for having me. I am thrilled to be here. It feels great to be with my Hog Island friends tonight. I see a lot of friendly faces and familiar names and faces out there. Um, so we'll just begin with our presentation, right? Are you going to, um, are you introing Tai Chi now or do you want me to launch right into it? You can launch right in and, and after... Okay. Her presentation, I will introduce Taiki, our bird connection speaker, Excellent. and open it up for questions for both. Perfect. All right. Without further ado, I am going to share my screen here. All right. We're going to launch right into the basics of birding. So this is going to be an intro on uh, learning what you need to bring with you when you want to go out in the field and start looking at and learning about birds. So who is a birder? So this is a question I know to some of you this is very obvious, but actually a lot of people stumble with this one. And people who I think are a birder and who most people would uh, identify as birders say that they are not birders. But birder is the same thing as a bird watcher. It's anyone who pays attention to birds and thinks about what they're looking at. Anyone that attracts birds closer to enjoy them. Like if you have bird feeders in your yard, or if you just love watching birds as you take a walk through your neighborhood, you are a birder. Really anyone who seeks out birds to see, even in their own yard, everybody is a birder. But what are the basics of birding? The basics, what do you need to be a birder? Your eyes and ears. First off, your senses are your best tools that you have. So your eyes and ears are going to give you the opportunity to observe in different ways, become incredibly focused. But time, even a short period of time is what obviously you're gonna need to be in the field thinking about uh, the birds that you're looking at. Patience. Okay, I can't emphasize this enough because it's not just patience in the moment with looking at birds because it does require patience. It's a show out there, but we got to be patient while we're watching it. But you also need to be patient with yourself because like any other sport or skill that you learn, you're not going to be an expert right from the get-go. You need to learn how to practice. Also, of course, enthusiasm. Always delight in the uh, simple things you see. Learn, ask questions, bring so much curiosity to the table. Every day, no matter how long you've been looking at birds and for how many years, you are gonna learn something new. Well, what do you need? What are the tools that you need to be a good birder or to learn how to bird? Well, binoculars, of course, your optics are tools that will help you become a better birder. Binoculars just bring the birds in closer to your eyes. Now, some of us have tools like spotting scopes, but at first, when you're first starting, binoculars are probably the most basic tool you need. 
and you don't have to have anything totally fancy. I'm gonna explain a little bit more about binoculars in a few minutes here. Also, field notebooks. Now, I can't stress this enough. Field notebooks, some of you might say that's an old school practice. Really, if you start taking notes and you can get a field notebook that for less than $10, the one you see here in the picture is mine, um, and I think I paid like $9.99 for it, really inexpensive, really fantastic. It fits in my back pocket and I can take it. I can sketch birds. I can write comments, notes. If I meet another birder, maybe I'm going to write down their email. It's always a value. And you know what? You will thank yourself later if you have a field notebook and you bring it with you. Incredible learning tool. Also, of course, identification guides. There are so many out there available. And now today we're really lucky because we also have apps or tools that we can use on our devices in order to help us learn um, even further. And I'm gonna cover some of those later. Also, I can't stress enough finding birding mentors. Men your mentors are gonna help you learn how to see birds in your own area. So mentors are great for identification. They can help, help you learn by pointing things out to you but also they can teach you how to bird habitat, where to look in a habitat. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes as well. Binocular basics. So we'll launch right into the optics. Again, I was saying um, binoculars are great to have. You don't need anything terribly fancy, but there are some things you might wanna keep in mind. Okay, so Binoculars come in a variety of sizes and powers, but more power does not always mean that you're gonna have a better view of the bird. So what are all these numbers that you see? So, okay, the first number when you're looking at your binoculars, and I'm gonna show you, have bear with me here. The first number is the power. So on a lot of binoculars, you're gonna see a number like eight by 42, let's say. Eight is the power it's eight times what your eye can see unaided, okay? So you're gonna be able to see eight times closer. And then the number at the other end, the eight times 42 or eight by 42, the 42 is the amount of light that scattered. So 42 millimeters is the objective end, that's the end of the binocular here. And that is going to be the light gathering. Now, the thing with that is, the wider or larger that end of the objective end lens is, the heavier binoculars are going to be. And for something that you're wearing on your body, that's always something to consider. So most birders like to have something around 42. That's about average. Some binoculars come up to 50 millimeters, but they can be quite heavy. So I personally use eights, usually eight by 42. But there's also 8x32s, which are fantastic and bring in just as much light. That's actually what these are right here. All right. Not what happened here. All right. So as I was saying, 8x42 eight by, um, is what most binocular birders like to use. Some people might have something even larger, like 15 by uh, 60 or something like that. But again, find something that fits your hand and also interpupillary distance. That's the space between your eyes is really important. Most binoculars you can customize to your face. So you wanna make sure that something fits your hands. I have tiny hands, so sometimes it's hard for me with some binoculars, I also have closer set eyes. So some binoculars don't work for me. So I have to find some, and this is something to keep in mind, that work for your face. They should be able to customize to what your needs are. Also, something to keep in mind is having waterproof binoculars and fog-proof binoculars. Now, of course, sometimes if you have an air-conditioned car and you step into a humid environment, you're not gonna have binoculars that don't fog up. It's just impossible. But something to keep in mind is the durability and most good binoculars, and when I say good, you can find really good binoculars for around $200. You don't have to go real high on the high end. You can, and the amount of money you put into your binocular is gonna reward you with durability and also a little bit better glass. That's what it's all about when you get those higher end binoculars is the glass and the quality that they can bring in sharpness and also light. 
But really, if you're just beginning, I would recommend something moderate. And if you continue to bird, then you can uh, buy yourself a better pair of binoculars later. All right, this is something, finding birds with your binoculars um, that I know a lot of birders struggle with, especially when you're new to it. So one of the biggest things you can uh, take with you in the field with your binoculars are your eyes, of course, and finding those birds with your eyes first. So I know a lot of times if I'm leading walks and somebody is calling out a bird, people put their binoculars up and start to look for them, trying to find them with the binoculars. But actually, your eyes are the best tool here. So finding the bird with your eyes and then always having your hand on your binoculars while you're wearing them with your finger on the focus wheel. Just I always rest my uh, index finger on the focused wheel and then I bring it up to my eyes. So I'll find the bird, I'll fix on it, and then I'll bring my binoculars up while I'm still looking at the bird. I would recommend that you practice this. I call it target practice. So find a spot to practice keeping your eyes on something while lifting your binoculars. If this is something new for you, it, the more you practice it, like anything else, the better it's going to seal into your muscle memory and you're gonna have an easier time when you need it because after all, birds are quick. So I recommend trying this with something stationary in your yard or your neighborhood. And you know, another uh, good tip is to look for airplanes in the sky. Find them with your eyes, pull your binoculars up and then focus. It's a good way to learn. And this is one of the things that will help you get on birds quicker in the field. So tips for observing birds, getting into birding mode. So when you wanna look for birds, you wanna to try to keep as quiet as possible. Birds, like other animals, get startled easily by loud noises and even uh, quick movements. So again, try not to make too many sudden movements. Of course, walking is, is okay, but if you're swishing around or um, making a lot of noise, of course, <laughs> that's not gonna be encouraging for birds to come any closer. Tune your eyes and ears into your surroundings. So take a moment, quiet yourself down, and look and listen to the world around you. Let yourself settle into the world, the natural world, and think about the sounds you're listening to. We have to slow ourselves down because we live in such a fast paced world and we're used to instant gratification. However, birding isn't always gonna provide us with instant gratification. So slowing down is really critical to having the best uh, opportunity to see birds in the field. Watch for movements from one spot. So either stand in place and watch the world around you or find a spot to sit in your yard. Um, and I would recommend that you practice these things often. Um, so even just going out in your yard and letting the birds come to you, finding what is called a sit spot or somewhere to sit in a place, in a park, in a city park, especially, especially city parks, birds there are so accustomed to people that they don't seem to be as phased by people mulling around. So you'll have birds coming even closer when you're in a park oftentimes. But if you sit and watch closely and you stay still, the birds will come to you. So one of the biggest tips I can give you, and this is how I started out, is learning the birds in your own neighborhood first. If you want to learn birds, this is the best way to do it for a lot of reasons. Well, first, when you get to know the locals uh, first, um, those will become really familiar to you. And as you go on, you're gonna be able to, uh, whoops, um, learn new faces, new birds. So the goal isn't to put a name to the birds you're seeing at first. You just kind of want to absorb what's going on around you. Get familiar with your surroundings. Recognize these species. And, and a solid foundation to learning is learning those birds right outside your own door. Getting familiar with them so that you don't have to identify them. Of course, I'll stress this again. Bring a notebook with you when you go outside. That little tiny notebook, it could be any kind of notebook or scrap paper, really. 
But it's really going to help you if you start taking notes about who you're seeing, even if it's just keeping a list of, I saw the American goldfinch in my yard today. It's getting in that practice of becoming familiar and tuning in to the world around you. Once you learn these birds, you'll be able to expand your horizons and add more species into your repertoire and your knowledge base. Now, another thing to consider is learning what birds should be in your area on any given day of the year. Um, a great tool to help you learn is the Merlin ID app by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So this is the home screen of Merlin and probably a lot of you have them, Merlin. Um, this is a free app. One of the best things though with Merlin is that you can add, uh, you can tweak it so that you can see which birds are likely in your area. Now knowing what birds are likely in your area all of a sudden condenses the opportunity um, of what you're going to see. Basically, you are finding a menu available to you that will um, condense how many species are expected in your area on any given day. Then it becomes less overwhelming because if I see a bird that is uh, black and, and, and blue, I'm going to want to know, okay, well, I'm going to flip through a field guide and try to find a black and blue bird well, but that could be a lot of different birds, including birds that aren't even in my own area. We wanna make sure the birds are, that you're looking for in your guides are gonna be in your area. And one of the best way to do it for your own neighborhood, for, for me, it even says my um, town name, Downingtown, Pennsylvania, and it tells me which are likely in the area. So I can't stress this enough about learning what birds are in your area and when. This is called status and distribution, and it's something that will help you build your skills as a birder if you are tuned in to status and distribution as you go forward. All right, so where to look for birds? Well, everywhere, <laughs> but especially where, you'll, where you're going to find what they love to eat. Of course, Birds, most birds need protein like other animals. So they're going to be looking for things like bugs or animals to eat or seeds. Okay. And sometimes you even find birds because you get clues from the birds around you, like this eastern screech owl that I found because I was listening to the chickadees making scolding noises. Now, birds have a lot of different vocalizations. And learning the language of birds is a whole different series uh, that we could go into. But tonight, we're just going to focus on the basics. But, you know, we don't have to know what birds are saying to each other in order to understand if a bird is agitated. If you find a bird that sounds like it's scolding, like shh, 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 noises like that, I would recommend you start looking to see where they are and see what they have discovered to clue you into something special. Now, looking for birds, birds are motivated by their food sources, of course, and that requires a habitat. Habitats need to be healthy. Um, habitats are like grocery stores and every bird has a special diet in order to survive and sustain itself in its own life journey. So the habitat should be like a grocery store um, where they can find all the food that they need, just like we require grocery stores to find food that we need to survive, right? But if the grocery store habitat is empty, then what happens? It's problematic, right? So we need to make sure that we're uh, keeping our habitats healthy for the birds. But visiting different habitats should reward you with different types of birds. Okay, so if you expand your horizons and go into different habitats near you or, or when you're traveling, you should find some different birds to learn. Where do you look for birds? Well, some of the best places to look are um, at the tops of trees, like this mockingbird on the left there, and also uh, along edges. Birds love edges. Many birds are edge specialists. That means we can find them along hedges um, or even just uh, landscaping that divides different um, yards. Anything like that is very good because it provides shelter and screening from predators, but it also often provides food. 
Of course, many birds are foraging or feeding on the grass like American robins um, and chipping sparrows. And at this time of year, we see a lot of palm warblers on the ground, but also of course in the sky. Um, during migration, we can see hawks in flight, we can see turkey vultures, all sorts of birds utilizing the airspace. The airspace is actually habitat too, and an important one. Well, finding birds also can be a lot of fun if we start to look into where they are near us. So I would recommend using citizen science to learn how to find birds around you. And one of the best tools besides the Merlin ID app is eBird.org. So for those of you who aren't familiar, eBird.org is the Cornell Lab of Ornithology's online database of birds. And we can learn so much about birds just through this free online website. So eBird, you can explore species, as you can see on the left here. Um, you can explore, you can type in the name of a bird and learn about that bird, its life, and where you might find it. If you explore regions, as I, as I have on the left here, you'll see that you can find uh, birds in your own neighborhood, your own county. It goes from a uh, country to state or province right down to your own local region. You can find hot spots if you wanna seek out a bird species that you've never seen before or want to see. If you use the tool that says species map right down here on the left bottom, you'll be able to type in the name of the bird and figure out where that bird is by looking at um, observations that other people like you and I are contributing to the eBird uh, database. And so um, you can become an eBirder very easily, but I would recommend if you do so, that you uh, they have a tutorial on how to uh, have the best practices for eBirding. Um, but eBirding is, is very easy um, once you get the hang of learning how to do it. Also, another database um, that you could use to find birds in your local area, along with all sorts of other wildlife and plants, uh, is the iNaturalist.org app. Um, and going into iNaturalist, you're able to see where birds are around you also. People contribute their photos and their sightings, just like we do in eBird. And that's another useful tool for finding birds. Strategies for identification. Well, we're just lightly going to touch on this tonight because, of course, that would take <laughs> a whole uh, another hour at least. And if you want to learn more about learning identification, I definitely recommend that you go to Hog Island Camp when you can. And, and we'll teach you um, how to identify birds. But some of the uh, strategies that um, are best in learning identification are a process or a method. And um, what I like to recommend is starting with this. And this is first starting with the size of the bird. So how big is the bird that you're looking at? And you need to think about it in context. So a lot, a lot of times we think about size and I know I'm guilty of saying, well, it was kind of a big bird. Well, was it as big as an ostrich? Or are you talking it was bigger than a hummingbird? So think about it as if you're talking about an American robin. This is a bird that most people can identify and understand how big they are because we see a lot of them on the ground, okay? And so that bird is about 10 inches. So when you're talking about size, well, think about it. Was it bigger or smaller than a robin? And thinking about that size, next move into its shape. So what's the general shape of the bird? Did it have a long neck? Did it have a long bill like some of the birds here featured? Or did it have a tiny little bill that was um, looks like a, a little tweezer that's meant for picking out caterpillars? Could be that it even has a bill that looks like a spoon, like this roseate spoon bill on the, the slide here. So shape is important because how a bird is shaped dictates where it lives and how it feeds. So these are important important clues in identifying the bird. Also, pay attention to a bird's behavior. Birds, like people, behave in different ways 
that are unique to their species. So for example, earlier I was talking a little bit about the palm warbler, which is migrating through right now most of um, the region that most of you are, are um, viewing from. And this is a small warbler that likes to flick its tail or pump its tail up and down. So that's a behavior. So when you see something that's unique like that, well, the bird likes to pump its tail, write it down in your field notebook. Think about that, watch birds and think about how they're behaving. Could you recognize the bird based on its habitat? Or, and could you recognize the bird based on how it's behaving. It's sort of like, can you recognize your friends and how they dance? Could you recognize your friend and how they move as they're walking towards you through a restaurant? You probably can because you're familiar with them and you've seen them behave. You may not even recognize yourself that you're picking up on these clues. But as we watch birds more and more, we'll learn their behaviors and learn how to recognize them through these behaviors. Patterns of color. Well, color is great to look at, but it's best seen in patterns. Where the color is placed on a bird's body um, is going to give you a lot of clues. So looking at a bird, sometimes because birds change their feathers usually and aren't always gonna look the same depending on if they're young or what time of year it is because a lot of birds will go through molt they may not always have the same pattern or, or always have the same color, but the pattern remains the same generally. So pick up those clues and look at what you see. Do you see bold white wing patches like a mockingbird might have? Do you see um, a, a, a black head and a white belly? These are things, these are patterns of color that we want to clue into to help us make our identification the birds we're looking at. Of course, habitat is really important. And all these things we just talked about, a bird's size and its shape, how it behaves, and even its patterns of color, especially when it helps to camouflage a bird, because birds are meant to be camouflaged so that they're less vulnerable to their predators, right? So we, we think about this in regards to habitat. And habitat is important because you're not usually going to find a shorebird like um, a least sandpiper in your backyard foraging around underneath your bird feeder, right? Um, because those birds need to be in muddy habitats looking for insects and or in invertebrates, worms and things like that in soft mud. So unless your backyard has um, a little muddy edge to a pond, you're probably not going to see a least sandpiper there. However, um, habitat is going to tell you a lot about where you might find a bird you might be looking for. So if you have, uh, keep, keep all of these things in mind. And if you have um, um, uh, habitats that invite birds in, like native plants, planting native plants, uh, planting flowers that encourage uh, th their own wild bird feeders, um, you will be rewarded with inviting birds into your own spaces. So habitat, I can't stress enough the importance of habitat. So all these things add up to um, making your ID process um, much more fine-tuned, but just keep going through these things and practicing them over and over. And I promise it'll help you in the field. All right, so another thing uh, that will help you as a birder is finding other birders to learn from. So finding local Audubons, finding uh, birding groups near you that have people that sponsor uh, bird walks weekly. Attend these bird walks, go to them, seek them out and learn because birders love to share their information. They can also teach you how to bird habitats and landscapes. They can show you new areas in your region that maybe you'd never visited before that you can go back to on your own. Of course, attending Hog Island Camp is uh, one of the best ways to learn with all the programs there that help us 
uh, find and learn about bird identification, but also learn how to look at birds and learn them by ear. And sometimes we might even uh, be able to learn about banding birds or some other projects that they have. But there's so many opportunities to learn about birds around you nearby. Now, if say you live in an area of the country where there aren't a lot of bird clubs, then finding Facebook groups or other groups where you can uh, join up and read what other people are saying. These are really helpful. And there are so many resources available. This way you can connect with other people, ask questions, and learn. All right, so the best part of having fun is sharing your passion with others and finding people around you in your neighborhood uh, that you can teach, pass it on to the next generation so that all of us can benefit from the joys of birding. So thank you very much, Eva and Hog Island for sharing uh, your time with me tonight and allowing me to share my passion of teaching people about how to learn how to bird. Thanks so much, Holly. Um, and thanks for all of you joining us from all around the world. We have people from Brazil and Nicaragua Audubon chapters in Florida. Uh, so it's so great to see so, uh, so many people on tonight and joining us. Uh, next, we have our Bird Connection presenter, Taiki James. Taiki is the Governmental Affairs Coordinator for National Audubon Society. He's also a co-organizer of the first Black Birders Week, and he hosts two podcasts for the Wildlife Observer Network. Thanks, Taiki, for being here tonight to talk about your work at the National Audubon Society. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. How's everybody doing today? Please, please save your applause. Holly, you really got them warmed up. They don't know how to calm down. <laughs> they, they got all this energy from you. I don't know how to keep them quiet <laughs> before I go. All right. Well, now that, hey, James, um, now that we are getting settled in, I am happy to be here with everyone and um, to make the most of this moment. I am going to do something that um, I notice a lot of people do on Zoom. Like it's like Zoom, not is it Zoom etiquette perhaps, but it's like a Zoom normalcy that you always announce that you're sharing your screen before you do it. But I just like to jump right in, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but technically I, I announced that I was going to share my screen by stalling. So this is a presentation that I give to that I've been giving to a lot of uh, different organizations um, recently because of Black Birders Week. And if you aren't familiar with Black Birders Week, it was this thing that happened on social media where um, black birders from all around the world, but predominantly the United States and Canada, came together after the uh, racist incident occurred in Central Park, New York, with Christian Cooper, a board member for NYC Audubon representing anybody from New NYC Audubon in the in the house in the building. Okay. Um, anyway, <laughs> we started this idea for uh, a Black Birders Week it was kind of born from that, but it is established in solidarity of the movement for Black Lives because when the Black experience became the national conversation. Black Birders Week made it clear that the Black experience goes beyond trauma. It includes joy, pride, resilience, strength, and style. And every single day of that week, we we did, excuse me, we did a little something to that effect. If you um, want to check out Audubon, National Audubon Society's Facebook page, you can see the Birding While Black live stream discussions. Those are still recorded on Audubon's Facebook page. There's two discussions, one with Christian Cooper, uh, the man who was named in the racist incident, and uh, Dr. J. Drew Lanham, the man who basically wrote the book on Birding While Black. So those were very enlightening discussions and um, inspired a lot of movement and inspired a lot of influence and inspired a lot of people to reach out to me and ask me, what can I do to help? I realized Black Birders Week went so far beyond what anybody could think. It inspired so many people to take action. So I kind of centralized what that action is. Um, 
it's in the form of a kingfisher. Kingfisher is my spark bird. Um, this is uh, me in my job. This is literally what I do before coronavirus and before I broke my ankle in January. <laughs> so this, these are bird walks I would do with congressional staff on the Hill. And um, through this, and I really liked a lot of what Holly said about birding um, because birding is not just an outlet for folks to find art, to find things locally and like have that appreciation, like building a familiarity with the bird species in your neighborhood or at your house or at your feeder is, is very important. I found that a uh, congressional staff who walk to their job, who walk to Capitol Hill, uh, to the congressional offices every day, never notice the birds that they walk by until they went on a bird walk with me. And when they did, they were just like, what? I can see a northern, what, what is that called? A, per, a parala? I can see a northern parala here next to my job. I'm like, well, it's called a parula, but we'll let that slide. Yes. Yes, you can. <laughs> Holly says, no, we're not going to let that slide. <laughs> not a fan of the parala. Um, so the gentleman to my right, he's from the Energy and Commerce Committee. He works uh, as one of the members of the general counsel. And his name... I forgot what his name was, but he's never birded before in his life. And two minutes in to me explaining how birding works, like what, like it, it almost literally what Holly said about like making sure you put your finger on the focus, you know, you bring up, you practice having a target, like all those things. As soon as he got those down, he was pointing out birds faster than me. Like I'm pointing out a house sparrow and I'm like trying to explain like, oh yes, the house sparrow, like get used to seeing this bird. You'll see it a lot. And then he'd be like, oh, but what's that bird over there? And I'm like, well, uh, well, that's a blue jay. And anyway, about the house sparrow. Okay. What's that bird over there? Oh, okay. That's a great cat bird. Oh, and anyway, back to the house sparrow. I'm like, this guy, was so excited about it and just like and he's about my age and just like igniting that excitement in someone that i can see eye to eye with even if we don't agree politically but just having that experience makes my job so special government affairs coordinator is the long way of saying bird lobbyist and as i mentioned my lobbying takes place birding um and you got to understand, you can have meetings with members of Congress and congressional staff where you talk about the details, you talk about the numbers, and you know you slide it across the desk as they do in those dramatic political shows. But when you can go out and have an experience birding with a member of Congress or a congressional staff, or, there's just something special in that that um, you, you really can't replace with anything. Um, and you know, before I broke my ankle, this was something that I did monthly. And um, where this picture is on the right side, we are actually in the U.S. Botanical Gardens because they typically open at nine o'clock. My bird walk start at eight because I needed to be earlier than the congressional office's opening. And when they saw that my eBird, that like, you know, the eBird checklist person, you know, is like, I went up from number 10 to number three. They were just like, wait, who's this guy coming in here at eight o'clock, you know, once a month? They greeted me because they just predicted I would be there. And they were just like, hey, we're going to open it up early for you just so you can see more birds, just so you can have this experience. Just, just congressional staff can really understand like the migratory bird presence that's right outside of their building. And yeah, that was, that was really awesome. One day we saw a hawk devouring a cardinal and it was, it was as dramatic as it was majestic. You know, I don't think nature is always about the pristine and the pure and the safe. The nature, so the metal, the, the, the earning of the meal, you know, the chase and birding can be that narrative, you know, and the way that it early and and all the, the same way you get real um visceral really natural part of the world just from observing birds and it's cool i haven't done it in a while because, you know, but it's actually gotten a lot better so hopefully i can take small groups out 
well, I don't know. We'll see. A lot of congressional staff aren't on the Hill nowadays um, because they don't really need to be. You know, if they can be virtual, we can be, you know, everybody can kind of be virtual. And the buildings are closed off to the public. So if constituents aren't coming in, to some degree, staff don't have to come in. But some members have different perspectives of coronavirus. So sometimes <clears throat> that, that could, that's a whole we can open that bag of chips when we're ready for that salsa, but it's a little too spicy for this conversation. This is something that I developed very, very rough draft of what I predict a bird walk look when you're doing a bird walk with a member of Congress. So when I was doing those bird walks with congressional staff, I'm one of the few birders in the DC office and I would have, you know, my colleagues in the DC office help me out with those bird walks, uh, but I would often do them by myself. When I'm trying to encourage uh, Audubon chapters to do these bird walks in congressional districts, like in the home of the member of Congress where it is most important, I think that this is kind of a good guide to, um, you know, break down the roles of the bird walk leader to something that not only can be shared, but decentralized for a more inclusive experience. Like, for example, I have one order, but you can perhaps have two orders for a bilingual experience. And, in, and instead of two people with the same field guide, maybe you have one person with a field guide and another person with feathers or another person with pictures of birds, you know, because sometimes people take their cameras and seeing the camera camera picture of the bird when, you know, it just was there for a second means so much compared to looking at it in the field guide, you know. Um, I think both can add to the experience for the group, but, you know, maybe that's something that you can add to it. And the pointers, maybe one pointer is really tall, another pointer is really short. Maybe they're a youth, you know, because they, oh man, they can see birds <laughs> like quicker, you know. So I just think that this kind of model can enable um, the finding and the support of strengths for uh, a diversity of strengths for the benefit of the group. Um, and, and so when I started this, I was talking about what a lot of people asked and, you know, where they felt inspired after Black Birders Week. They asked me, what can I do to help? And I put what can I do into three eyes. You know, like if I am a person, well, I'm going to say what you can do is normalize your values normalize how you demonstrate your values, especially when you don't have clear answers to questions like, is this right or wrong? Because what you have is your values and what you will have after the situation, what you should be proud of is your values as well. And if you're not proud of your values, well, then that's some type of reconciliation that you should um, take upon yourself. Or, you know, maybe we can talk it out together. That's fine. If you're an organization, you need to rationalize your code of conduct, your, your, your employee handbook, whatever it is that doesn't enable co-creation, I want you to look at every word, every letter, every space between every letter in that law constitution thing and rationalize all of it. You'll find difficulty in that because there are institutional blind spots written into a lot of these documents that say what can and what cannot happen. For example, at the National Audubon Society, there is, I'm sure, a procedure that was developed by the communications team to have the responsibility to have the Facebook Live. But when Black Birders Week happened, I said, hey, can I do this? And then they were just like, yes because they wanted this to be an opportunity to co-create. Black Birders Week was not something that National Audubon Society came up with. I just happened to work there and I was one of the folks that came up with it. And having the opportunity to use Audubon's platform was a co-creative process because there weren't any rules that were obstacles in the first place. And if there were rules, well then we, re we rationalize what those rules should be. And rationalizing might mean changing it, you know? And I don't know what those rules were, but it became rational for me to have the keys to the car for the Facebook, you know, live to have that conversation. And I'm glad it was part of history. And then the last thing, when I say, what I say to groups of workers, groups of students, groups of people, organize, whether that organization takes the form of group chats, whether that organization takes the form of affinity groups, or whether that organization organizing takes the form of unions. 
I think it's very important that you understand that this is an era of inspiration that we're living in and that some problems aren't going to change if you just change the laws. Some problems are going to be addressed when you have movements to address them. Black Birders Week is about a bigger movement in the environmental movement, not only to achieve environmental progress, but achieve environmental progress for all. And it is to make sure that that path that we are all on, we share the responsibility of providing orientation for folks so that they can take action on the environmental movement day one. We have to make sure that we are demonstrating, normalizing how we demonstrate our values when it comes down to inclusivity. And where we work in organizations and where those institutions have rules, have power, well, let's rationalize. Let's let's really look into what we can do to make this a co-creative process, a co-creative, like like codify how you can co-create with partners or 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 constituency or even the employees within the organization. Because that's also why it's so important that you organize. Coronavirus has left a lot of opportunity for people up top in those rooms to make decisions about where money goes and where money's not going to go with no accountability. And that, and that, and when there's no accountability demanded from the workers, well, you know, what are you going to do? Get mad about it by yourself? You're not organized. So some problems need some structural problems need structural fixes in the form of movements. So that was that's always something that I say to folks when they ask, what can I do to help? I can be a lot more specific. Like if you're a left-handed birder from Philly, I know what you can do to help because I used to be a left-handed birder from Philly. I mean, I'm still a left-handed birder from Philly. I'm just not in Philly anymore. Um, one of the things I really loved about Philly too was the fact that we had these birding backpacks, which is an idea. Anytime I have a platform to share, I will always want to share it. These birding backpacks you could get at the local library and it would have a decent pair of binoculars, like not some kid pair, but a decent pair of binoculars, um, a field guide like Sibley or something like that, Peterson, and uh, a trail map of the park adjacent to the library so that birding wasn't something that you would do if you were retired, older, white, and rich. No, birding was something you could do because you're a Philadelphian. Like you have a you have a library card, don't you? Aren't you from Philly? Yeah, of course. Well, you've been to this park, haven't you? Yeah, of course I've been. I'm from Philadelphia. You know, like this is my park. This is my neighborhood park. Well, wouldn't you enjoy going to your neighborhood library, taking out some resources and enjoying your neighborhood park in a way that not only educates and makes you appreciate that park a little more, but connects you to the city as like an identity? Yeah, okay. Yeah, let's go. What are we going to do after that? Maybe have brunch. I don't know. Birding and brunch was always like my favorite thing in Philly. But now, you know, I don't know what the brunch scene is like nowadays. Um, here's some random stuff that I'm working on um, unrelated to this. But that's technically my, um, not even technically, that is realistically my Twitter and my email. I'd be happy to answer questions that aren't able to be asked in the amount of time that we have left. Um, I am also very happy to speak to more groups about uh, maybe some of the projects that I'm working on or more specifically how inspiration for action can take place with your organization. Thank you so, so much for paying attention to all of that. Well, thank you both for your presentations. And I want to say thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we're able to provide programs like this with your donations. I'm going to put our donation link back in the uh, comment section. But now we get to turn the tables and uh, open up the floor to questions for both Taiki and Holly. Um, and some of you have already uh, been dropping those questions in the chat box or the comment section, uh, but keep those coming. And we'll get started right here with our first question from uh, Patricia. She asks, is there an app like Shazam for music where you can, uh, the app can identify the bird by the sound it makes? Uh, there are a few apps available right now. Um, and 
Um, one I can recommend is called Bird Genie. Um, but what I'd really recommend outside of doing that, I know there is a temptation to have something or someone identify a sound you're listening to for you. But the best way to learn and remember what you heard is by being able to identify it yourself. So whereas there are apps out there, like I said, there's Bird Genie, um, and there's a few other, I can't remember their names, but Bird Genie is a good one. Um, uh, I would recommend instead, maybe if you have a smartphone or some sort of device to make a recording. And on our smartphones these days, the microphones are fantastic. So if you, I use my iPhone all the time to record bird sounds, and then I put them into eBird, into my eBird checklist so that other people can learn and listen. It's another great way to learn bird by ear is by looking at eBird or the Macaulay Library. So eBird.org, if you look at those birds where I was showing you how you explore and then you seek out a species, you can find all the sounds they make. But a lot of those recordings are made by people like you and I on our smart devices. Now, what I was saying about that with recording is if you have a recording of that bird, you can then reference check it later and remember it better. Also, I would recommend as far as bird song, remember that field notebook that I was encouraging you to get, write down a few notes about the birds that you hear and or see. Even draw out the shape. Um, we see these sonograms that are made by bird recordings. If you look at Macaulay Library or eBird, you can see these where you can actually see the sound visually. So if you're a visual processor and you learn by visual uh, clues, that's going to help you as well. So that's what I would recommend. But yes, of course, there are apps out there that will identify it for you. And I should note that Merlin, I probably didn't say this, but it will also identify birds through artificial intelligence by photos, not by sound yet. I don't know if that's in the pipeline yet. Another one of our Hog Island instructors, Drew Weber, uh, leads the project for Merlin. Maybe he has a clue about that. I don't know. I haven't heard about it, but so that's my, my tip with that. Next question we have, um, we actually have from a couple of different people. So Margaret and Elizabeth both asked about the birding backpacks uh, that you mentioned, Taiki. Uh, it sounds like it's uh, inspirational and also a way to create access. Um, do you know uh, how they were funded or are they being replicated in other cities? As far as I know, they're not being replicated in other cities. The um, basic funding formula for it was the Free Library of Philadelphia and a bunch of birding groups, basically. Um, from that, it was just, it became something that um, I used heavily because I was working with Audubon, Pennsylvania at the time. And, you know, again, it was Fairmount Park and at the MLK library. So it was very easy for me to get to in North Philly. Uh, and I used it a lot. But now, you know, I live in DC. So I don't know what the condition of that is. I don't know what precautions currently should exist for uh, considering the uh, coronavirus. Um, but I am going to drop a link for the drilled out origin story of the birding backpacks. That would be great. I know in Colorado, the libraries have a similar program uh, that has a national park pass, a state park pass uh, included in the, in the backpack with the optics and some general um, naturalist field guides. So I think this is one of those things uh, that you know, you could take those words of inspiration and and certainly the link uh, that Taiki is sharing, and um, you know, make it something real in your own communities. So mm -hmm. one of those ways to definitely create uh, better access for people to get into birding and to you know get outdoors. And it doesn't always have to be about birds, right? Like I think the most important thing in that book bag is a trail map, actually. You know, yeah. I think that like the birding is kind of secondary, but you know, I, I definitely bias towards it. <laughs> Just want to throw that in. So our next question um, is, uh, Holly, you mentioned the specs on um, for, for general binoculars, but how about for a scope? If you're looking to buy a scope for the first time, uh, do you have any suggestions? 
Yeah, so um, spotting scopes are fantastic tools to bring the birds even closer than your binoculars do. So basically, this is a telescope. I mean, I can look at the planets with my, um, my spotting scope, but I wouldn't want to use a telescope that astronomers use to usually look at birds, okay? At least I don't think I would. <laughs> but at any rate, um, so what I would recommend, a lot of people have a fixed lens, like I think it's mostly 30. My spotting scope um, has a zoom lens, 20 to 60. Either way is good. Um, I would recommend that you find a spotting scope that's easy to carry around. Um, again, like binoculars, the wider the objective lens, that's the, the end of the spotting scope that you don't put your eye to, is the light gathering uh, ability of that spotting scope. Having a scope um, that has a wider objective lens is going to make it heavier, but it also will gather more light and you'll be able to see details clearly, especially during low light at dusk and dawn. So it depends on your birding style. If you think you're going to be out um, for uh, an early morning or later at night, you might want to consider a wider objective lens. Um, or, but if you're not, you know, I think that it's comparable during the daylight hours to have um, somewhere in the middle. So um, a lot of the spotting scopes, I've seen some of them, I think uh, Swarovski has one that goes up to 90, if I'm not mistaken, for the objective lens. Standard is around uh, 65. That's a good objective lens. And again, um, thinking about whether or not you want to zoom. The, the more you zoom in on something, the more unstable it can be when you're looking through it. Like for example, if I have my spotting scope up to 60, it means that it's it's going to be a little bit of a shaky image sometimes. Um, so having that fixed lens at like 30 or something, a lot of birders love that and they feel that it gives them all that they need to get a good look at a bird. So those are my tips on spotting scopes. Psyche, maybe you have something to add to that. <clears throat> From Black Birders Week, Vortex gave me a um, scope and I, or no, no, they didn't give me a scope. I ordered a tripod because I shoot a lot of mobile videos. So the tripod is also good for mobile videos. <laughs> uh, since both of you lead uh, birding walks, this is a great question, I, I would think, for both. It comes from Ronan. He asks, uh, when you're in a group, uh, in regards to bird sound, do you really focus on the the visuals or do you try to clue people into the sound? How do you, I think this kind of goes back to how to lead a bird walk, which is something um, that is not as easy as you may think. So maybe you, got, you could give some tips on how you can get other people interested in birds and leading a bird walk. So specifically when thinking about leading a bird walk and thinking about how to get people on birds, um, obviously people love to see birds and for a lot of birders, they won't consider having um, uh, seen the bird or put it on their life list until they see it, even if they've heard the bird and leaders have identified it for them or they learn to identify it. Now, if I'm leading a group, I try to um, give people the whole experience and I like to point out uh, birding by ear and, and identify as many birds for people as possible, but also by giving them tips on how to learn that bird, um, the bird vocalization that they're hearing so that they remember it later. So it, you know, it's great if I tell them what it is, they can enjoy it in that minute. But what I will love for them to be able to do is to have the confidence to uh, identify that same bird later. So I try to find the bird by ear uh, or hear, you know, I'm listening all the time, can't turn the bird brain off anyway, um, and uh, get people on it, like imitate the bird. If you're, if you're leader, um, maybe if you might imitate that bird that you just heard and try to get people to tune in also. It's like listening to something on the radio. Did you hear him say that? Did you sing that phrase or whatever? So um, that's something that I think is important um, in, in birding is, is not just just having the visual experience. Um, as far as pointing out birds, another thing to keep in mind, um, and I didn't point this out earlier, but I think it's really important to learn how to describe where you are looking at a bird, no matter if you're a leader or not, because 
you know, if you're if you're with a group of people and you were so excited to get them on that painted bunting you just saw, and you don't know how to tell them, well, it's in that tree over there, and and there's like a whole row of trees, but you're so excited in the moment you forgot how to tell them where to find the bird. Always be thinking about what you're looking at in the landscape and how you can references reference that to other people. After you do this for a while and practice doing this, like go outside in your yard and look around, find a common bird and think about where that bird is and how you would tell somebody else where that bird is. Okay, well, it's in the tree with the first limb that goes to the left that curves down like somebody's elbow. And think about it that way. Give them reference marks that you think, ah, oh, they're going to know exactly what I'm talking about. Because oftentimes it gets really uh, hard in, the, in that moment. And if you're not practiced at being able to describe where a bird is, oh, it can be challenging. And as we all know, birds fly quickly. And maybe you'll, you'll lose the opportunity, not just for those people to enjoy it, but for you to have the experience of enjoying showing a bird to somebody else. Taiki, you have anything to add? Um, uh, I typically go with the, um, like, imagine that there's, there's a tree and then my finger is like the trunks. And it's just like, well, if you go to the, you know, middle knuckle of my first finger on the branch, we'll see that there's a window that you can see the bird. You know, I do the best I can. <laughs> um, or I tell folks, I mean, I think folks have also used the clock method, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, and all that. Um, and... Yeah, sometimes uh, finding the bird is hard. I also use bird mnemonics if if it's, you know, really obvious, like tea kettle, tea kettle, tea kettle, cheeseburger, 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 respectively. Um, and, and, you know, other things. I think that there are really great ways to folks, for folks to like, um, in some ways, amp anthropomorphize birds in a way that they could remember them or experience them. I had someone tell me for the first time that they saw an American Robin, they saw it as a professor wearing tweed and a like um, autumn colored sweater vest with white lined glasses. And I was just like, and like a gray beanie. And I was just like, yes, yes, that, that is it. That is exactly what a Robin looks like. It looks like that professor, an English professor, probably they're definitely in liberal arts, you know, <laughs> whatever the case is. Um, I like that, you know, and I, and I, I always try to find ways that uh, for folks to connect to it. I did see a question uh, in the chat um, about a concrete example of normalizing a value. And I want to jump on that real quick. If that's okay, Eva, if that's the next Absolutely. Question. Go for it. Um, so I value inclusivity. And if it wasn't for... To a birder in a birding space that you're in, that you're sharing with this other birder, um, welcome. I don't know what difference it can make, but it's different than saying hi. It's different than saying, what are you doing here? It's different than saying, have you seen any birds? It's just welcome. Um, I value inclusivity in a way that I believe talking about race, gender, and identity are not taboo topics. So I am someone who normalizes how I talk about race. And, you know, obviously that can take some funny forms because I can make jokes, um, but it doesn't always have to be funny. It can just be the fact that I am communicating to someone, well, I don't want to go to that birding location because I'm black and I don't feel safe there. Because I'm not going to just like not say that, you know, like I'm going to be honest that if I'm in a white dominated space, well, I don't feel like that joke was as funny or I don't feel like staying with this. Welcome. Even though, yeah, we're all birders, even though, yeah, we're all feel welcome in the same way as anybody else, but I'm not going to like beat around the bush. I'm going to mention the elephant in the room. And, and, I, and I value that. And I think that a lot of the relationship that I have with people, they value that in me, that I speak directly to that. And I think that that needs to be normalized, not just in your interpersonal or not just in the burden community, but in your interpersonal relationships. Because talking about race, religion, gender, and identity, it's, it's all part of who we are. And our ability to talk about that demonstrates the progress that we can make. And that helps us define the barometers for progress. 
So the better we are at talking about it, the better it is for everybody. Yeah, thanks for, for sharing that, Taiki. I think definitely a, a message that um, that people need to hear, need to hear more of. Um, our next question from, um, from the chat here is about your walks that you do, Taiki, um, on Capitol Hill. Uh, Chuck asks, what are your legislative objectives um, when working for Audubon and leading these, these walks? Um, my first legislative objective is to make sure they see a raptor. They always want to see a raptor. Like they're always, always excited for a red tailed hawk. You know, they see one of those. They're like, oh my gosh, is that a vulture? Mm, it soars. Okay. Like vultures, vultures also soar. Great observation. But then, you know, when they like, oh, I see that all the time. Are you kidding me? And I'm like, yeah, that's what it is. Um, another legislative objective is to um, always ask folks, how long have you been birding? And if you don't know how long have you been birding because this is your first time birding, please say that. But then if you have a story about birding or why you chose this weird activity, because you're a congressional staffer, most of the things that you do involve meetings, not birds. Um, a lot of the times they tell me some weird, uh, funny story about how their uncle took them out midwinter to count literally every bird they saw. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that sounds like something you would do if it's the Christmas bird count. And they're like, yeah, what is up with that? It wasn't on Christmas. I'm like, I'm sorry. Winter bird count might be a more accurate name. We're working on the marketing. Don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, and I guess I'm answering that question to say that, like, I don't necessarily have a legislative objective because I'm building a relationship. I'm building an experience because that interaction that we had, that's what I'm going to reference the next time we meet. And then we're going to be talking about WERDA or HR 7705 that is the River Basin Transfer Commission Act, where we want to uh, change the funding authority from the Army Corps of Engineers to the Environmental Protection Agency. Because when we're talking about water quality, when we're talking about water management, well, I think that that is something that really falls under the EPA, not just for the regulatory authority they have and power to them under the Clean Water Act, but just because this is about the environment. This is not just about infrastructure and engineering. But before we even get to that conversation, we get to talk about birds. So it's just so meaningful to, to lead in not with a legislative objective, have that relationship. And then when there's time for that objective, there's really, really, really great chemistry when we have those meetings. Our next question, and I, I saw, Holly, that you may have responded um, in the chat, but it'd be great to share with the whole group about. Uh, so the question was from Isabella. Any tips for getting into birding as a team? Well, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that Hog Island has a, a phenomenal teen birding camp, which I had the privilege um, and honor to be an instructor for one year, um, uh, where you can meet other like-minded young people who enjoy birds and learn together. Um, but I think now there are so many opportunities for young people to connect um, because of digital technology. So there are many different um, Facebook groups for young birders. Um, there's also uh, uh, subreddits um, for for younger birders, as well as other chat forums um, available and uh, where young birders can meet up virtually. And, um, you know, it's having other uh, people who are like-minded and share your interests, especially when you're young, is so valuable and important. Um, and, and many of the young birders today are just off the charts phenomenal birders because they are uh, dedicated, serious, and it's, it's something that is inspiring. And when you are able to have peers um, to share uh, what you're seeing and, and tips on learning, you're gonna learn faster and they're gonna be uh, very inspiring to you. So I hope that you're able to connect with a young birder group near you um, and or if there isn't a young birder uh, organization, I mean, many of the statewide ornithological societies or organizations have young birder uh, groups affiliated with them. Um, but if you don't have that in your local area, again, 
uh, it's just a fantastic way now on digital platforms to connect with other young birders. So Taiki, you probably have some thoughts on that too with your connections. That is correct. Um, please use TikTok. Is that what they? <laughs> I mean, outside of that, um, I was part of a group from Black Birders Week that also um, engineered and is working on starting uh, its own nonprofit, Black AF in STEM, which is a space for, for Black folks in uh, the STEM fields. Uh, so that includes birding because a lot of folks come into birding in a lot of different ways. I know folks that got into rocks and was introduced to birds through rocks somehow. And, you know, geology, man, that was a hard class for me, but I learned so much. Um, and there's also organizations like the Birding Co-op. That's a very new organization that sets to create a global birding community. And that's something that I feel represents when we're asking the question, who's ready for 2050, why 2050? 2050 is the year predicted that um, the projected population of who we call minorities in this country today will actually be the statistical majority. So by 2050, white people will be the minority in the United States. I mean, currently there's more people of color in the world, you know, but we still call them minorities, whatever. But at least in, in this country, 2050 will match shifts, at least pluralistically. And what organizations will uh, see that this is this is a moment to have, this is a fork in the road kind of moment to say, are we going to make steps that make us relevant, sustainable, and ready for 2050? Or are we not? It's as simple as that. And the status quo is saying that we're not going to do that. The status quo is unsustainable for 2050. A hybrid of the status quo is unsustainable. So it's not like a little bit of the new stuff, a little bit of the status quo. No, like the hybrid or, you know, even the status quo light with zero calories is still unsustainable. No matter how many calories it has this time. So I kind of forgot the point because I kind of got mad, but <laughs> just know the status quo is unsustainable. All right. Not not for 2050. Oh, the Burden Co-op is <laughs> going to be one of those organizations that I believe is ready for 2050. So look into joining something like that and verbal retweet of Holly in the idea of finding those virtual groups because coronavirus makes it a little hard to like show up to meetings or show up to bird walks, you know, and things like that. So, I mean, I started a network of black birders in DC. I'm also a co-chair for uh, a scholarship for black and Latinx birders that attend or live in the DMV, Delaware, uh, uh, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and DC. Um, you know, hopefully to give out $5,000 this year to two folks. Um, so some of it is creating your own space because I have found in my three years, not a very long time, but in my three years working in this mostly, um, in this white dominated space of the environmental advocacy world, I have found that fitting into someone else's reservation at someone else's restaurant, reading somebody else's menu is a very, very, very different experience to navigate than creating your own restaurant, creating your own menu, creating your own table and your own chairs with folks that believe in a vision that this is a restaurant that's going to be built than more than just us. This restaurant is not just about us in the present, but we are thinking about constantly who might be here in the future and how those folks should be better off than us. So, you know, I'm always thinking about those two things. And so I want to also share that as inspiration as things do exist, maybe creating your own is the better answer. Well, I want to um, wrap up our evening here by saying thank you all for joining us, for supporting Hog Island Audubon Camp. A big thank you to both of our guest speakers tonight. We're very excited about our Making Bird Connections uh, lecture series. We'll be here next Tuesday um, and all the following Tuesdays uh, going through November. Um, next week, we have a wonderful presentation by Tom Johnson about birding by ear. And our bird connection speaker will be Brooke Bateman from National Audubon Society talking about climate science. So that's on Tuesday, October 13th at 7 p.m. Eastern. We definitely hope uh, that you've enjoyed tonight 
And we hope to see you in the future at this lecture series. Thanks again, Holly, Taiki. It's been wonderful. And thanks to everyone out there for joining in and for participating. We really appreciate it. Yeehaw. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Happy birding. Very nice. Thanks, Eva. Yeah, thanks, Holly. I really, I really enjoyed it. And um, so this is streaming over on Facebook and um, and it will be up there for people to view. So if, if people missed um, tonight, if, you know, if people reach out to you and say, oh, I missed your lecture, um, tell them they can go on Facebook and watch it because um, it's we have kind of that live stream going on over there. Um, okay. but, you know, thank you so much. It's been great. Yeah, it's been great. Great to see you. All right, yeah. everybody, come to Hog Island. <laughs> yeah, and, and thank you all who are out there on the call still. It's so great to see so many uh, Hog Island campers, yeah. instructors, and um, people from the birding community. We feel the love and support at Hog Island, and uh, we're just excited that you were here with us tonight, and we'll see you soon. Bye, everyone. <laughs>